Okay, this is week five, lecture one, part two. Uh, part one is posted. Um, as I said towards the end of part one, I will try to keep this uh, as abbreviated as possible. I don't want to be confusing. Um, so again, if I, I am abbreviating too much, please uh, send me an email and we can talk about it. Um, I can try to clarify or expand or explain so because these are important issues to understand and that's why I, I'm spending the time on it that I will I will try to finish the, the last three slides of, of this lecture uh, week five lecture one um, in this segment uh, part two so there won't be a part three I hope um, and I'll try to be as concise uh, as possible in, in lecture uh, week five part uh, second lecture for this week. I, we'll see what we can do. Uh, my apologies, but I think this is important. And so without further ado, um, we'll take off where we left off with uh, the slide, the quantification of grace. Now, we talked about the uh, university context. We talked about the decline of, of university studies. We talked about the need for uh, uh, dealing with the anxiety in public out there in, in light of the crisis, in light of the schism and the plague and everything that had been going on in Europe. How do we address this on a pastoral level uh, and on a theological level? In the first issue there, uh, on the quantification of grace, is grace and the sacraments. Grace is a difficult term. Uh, you know, going back to the, the debate between uh, Augustine or Augustine and, and Pelagius, which I believe I, I, I've addressed at least in, in, in brief, no one, uh, including Pelagius, ever claimed that uh, humans earn their salvation strictly on their merit. Pelagius um, claimed that creation uh, is part of God's grace uh, and mercy, that uh, free will as part of God's grace and mercy. One of his followers, Julian of Aclanum, came close to arguing it was purely uh, what we earn, what we merit, what we're worth. But especially after the condemnation of Pelagius in 418, no one proclaimed themselves a Pelagian. That is that one side. The other side is uh, the Augustinian side of predestination, that there's nothing that we can do. It's all based on uh, God's uh, Force, not even foreseen, but predetermined decision to save some uh, out of, in Augustine's view, out of the uh, total mass of the damned, uh, that God in his mercy and grace has selected a, a few for salvation. Now, those are the two extreme uh, positions, so to speak. And as I tried to indicate uh, with Jordan of Quedenborg, the Augustinian position was very close to the to Augustine's position, that extreme position uh, 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 on grace and predestination. The issue, though, was, okay, if there is grace, and if it's not simply uh, complete predestination, so we have no say whatsoever, so to speak, uh, which is not really Augustine's point, but easily translatable into that, uh, or understandable why people would would see it as such. How do we receive grace? If there is somehow grace is needed, even after what's called first grace or the general grace of God, how do we come about to get more grace, sanctifying grace or justificatory grace, grace that will allow us to what? Get into heaven. The sacraments were always, had always been seen as the means of grace, the means by which humans receive God's grace. And after 1215, I talked about this before, we have the codification of the seven sacraments. And by participation in those sacraments, you receive grace. Now, baptism was absolutely essential. If you weren't baptism, baptized, basically you were going to, to hell. Um, and that was kind of harsh. It was seen as harsh. You know, poor babies for Augustine, uh, Augustine, a newborn baby, even, or even a young toddler. It was just one big bundle of sin because all they think about are themselves. Me, 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 me. But on the other hand, it's like, well, yeah, but it's not really their fault. And you know, they just come out that way. Obviously, they're not consciously trying to sin. Are they really innocent? Are they innocent until they get to an age where they start to think, I'm going to be naughty. and I'm not going to do what I'm told. Um, so how do we handle the death of the innocents? Uh, there was problems there all along uh, on a human emotional basis uh, in various positions as well. 
But in 1175, we have for the first time uh, in the sources the, the identification of the creation of the discovery of the great book Discovery of Purgatory by Jacques Leroux. This is coming from of purgatory for the first time referred to as, as a place. Purgatory, purgation had always been there from uh, early on, but purgatory as a place where souls could go. Now there was, it had been just heaven or hell, but then for those who were not quite good enough, and I think I've gone over this briefly before, so just I'll, I'll cover this briefly. For those who weren't good enough to get into heaven right away, this idea of purgatory, a place where you would go to finish um, purging yourself of all the unforgiven sins, of all the unabsolved sins, um, or insufficiently absolved sins, um, and that would give you an option of eventually then, after a certain amount of time in purgatory, eventually getting into heaven. You didn't really go from purgatory to hell. Purgatory was part of the saved, but you just weren't good enough to go directly into heaven. Whereas if you're going to hell, you're going to hell. There's not a lot you can do about it. But that doctrine of purgatory, um, again, at the end of the 12th century, became a very important doctrine. Also pastorally, just think about it, because, you know, how many of us are perfect saints? Um, you know, and if you claim you are, there's probably is evidence that you aren't. Uh, so that gets to be a, a, a real issue. And this was a way to alleviate worry and anxiety. Don't worry about it if you're, you know, if you're trying to be good, if you're doing your best. I'll come back to that in a second, as you can see. Um, you know, at least you'll, you might have to go to purgatory, but eventually you'll be in heaven anyway. So that's a, a, a good thing and alleviate some of the, the anxiety. So, now, how do you receive grace but with the sacraments? Um, and this gets out the, uh, the quantification. Grace began to be seen as a quantifiable entity, as did sins, as did time in purgatory. It's called infused grace. There's all kinds of different definitions of grace. There's the general grace of God. There's the justifying grace of God. There's the cooperative grace um and a lot of and then there's infused grace there's external grace extrinsic grace there's all kinds of different graces and so what are we really talking about and as i've already mentioned that was a type of thing that scholastics academic theologians at universities love to do okay you know humans are, are saved by god's grace and mercy what does that mean what kind of grace are we talking about does that mean that we have no contribution and on we go from there um and so this infused grace was like an injection of grace. And I've often uh, made the analogy to um, uh, the Harry Potter movies. I mean, the books are better. But one of the things I like in the movies, if I don't know if any of you are Harry Potter fans, but if you've seen the movies, you know about the house cup. And then they have those big uh, cylinders filled with beads. And if someone gets you know two points for Gryffindor, they get two little beads. If someone gets points taken away from Gryffindor, the beads go down. That became very much what was seen as uh, grace and sin. Our soul was one of those cylinders. And when we would die, we'd be measured. How much grace do we have? And is it sufficient to get into heaven? Is it sufficient to go into purgatory, but not for very long? Or is it really, you know, maybe we don't have enough at all and we go right to hell? That's what I'm talking about, the quantification of grace. It was seen in those kind of economic terms. Double entry bookkeeping, debits and credits. Were, uh, have been developed by Italian bankers and merchants um, pretty early in the 12th century. And it's very much this economic sense of transaction and what do I get, what do I receive, what do I owe? You know, you've seen already with Jordan of Quedlinburg, he defined religion as paying what is owed, um, basically. And that became this quantifiable entity. So we get estimations of you know how much grace is needed, so to speak, and if you have to go to purgatory, how much sins are worth in purgatory, how long you have to spend in purgatory. Um, and that will be important coming up um, because it, it was only in 14, what is it, I wrote it down, 1476, this is also in my book though, uh, when Pope Sixtus IV proclaimed that um, um, indulgences, and I'll be talking a lot about indulgences later, not in this le lecture, but later on, could be applied to souls already in purgatory. That was a somewhat rare, very recent thing, 1476. Indulgences have always been referred to you know, indulgences for yourself. Uh, 
but to apply it to souls already in purgatory is a whole other issue, and we'll get back to that when we talk uh, about the immediate context of Luther and his critique. But that concept of how many years in purgatory, how many years off of purgatory Mariatoris works would, would be worth. Um, you know, they have, I have documents I've talked about with the Augustinians, if you know, contribute, or from the city of Airfort, actually, that might work for the Augustinians, that if you would, you know, contribute to building a chapel, not so much as, you know, penance for something that's been imposed on you, but simply out of the goodness of your heart, that could get, get you, you know, 25,000 years off of purgatory. So it served as, an, as a motivation to do, quote unquote, good works, to do charitable works, to contribute this or that, to go on a pilgrimage, to have a special devotion, um, could gain you time off of purgatory. And so it was really this accounting, the book of life, which is actually uh, biblical from the book of Revelation, opened you up and it became this big accounting book. You know, how much time in purgatory do you have left? Um, do you have any at all to go right to heaven? Or are you even in the ballpark or do you go right to hell? Or, you know, are there still things that, you know, you don't aren't aware of that is going to cost you time in purgatory? So they'd be added all up and say, okay, you have uh, 120,000 years in purgatory. Uh, you got off uh, for these extra works of, uh, of good works and, and mercy and charitable deeds uh, about 80,000 of them that's you know 125,000 minus 80 that still leaves you 45,000 years in purgatory damn well okay at least I'm on the way that's the kind of thing I, I mean we're talking about quantification of grace now what are we all talking about and what are the doctrines and the differences because of the quantification of grace and the infusion of grace and receiving indulgences from purgatory was all based on how you lived your life and what merit uh, you, you achieved. And that was known as the sanctification process. <coughs> I have up there justification and sanctification. I'll be coming back to that in the next slide. Essentially, justification is what is needed to get into heaven. Uh, I think I mentioned previously that the Latin word... Um, Justus, uh, justitia, justitia is justice. It's also righteousness. Now, that's not dealing with sanctification. I'm still just dealing with justification right now. The question was then, uh, justification, justitia, um, how do you become justified? It's a legal term, justice. Is part of that justice is part of that how do you justly get into heaven on what basis and how is it all uh, proclaimed and there are differing views of that process of justification sanctification on the other hand was how do you live a holy life how do you become holy how do you become a good person how do you live a Christian life and to what extent do you do so thoroughly or only in part are you making progress? Um, Jordan referred to those who are just beginning in the religious life, not necessarily as monks, but as just devoting themselves to God. Uh, I talked about uh, last time we were talking about pastoral theology and Jordan's theology, the beginners. And then you have those who are making progress and then you have the perfect, which again, of course, for Jordan was not perfect, meaning not that you couldn't get better. It was meaning that they achieved a level of complete, so you're a complete saint, so to speak. And how do we do that how do we achieve that that status of living a holy life of being a, you know, a good christian that was a separate question from how do we get into heaven the issue was how are justification and sanctification related and i'll get back to that in, in the next slide but i wanted to introduce those terms here because grace and infusion of grace applied to both um you know justification was based on god's grace period but, but it was not without human merit and achievement, by and large. Now, if you're the Augustinians, that's not how you saw things at all. Uh, I've already addressed that to a degree, and I'll come back and we'll be addressing it later as well. But I'm talking about the general theological development at this time, especially as we get into the 15th century and the later 15th century, trying to make things easier for people to understand and easier how to live a, a, a Christian life without the fear of God and damnation. And those are issues I'll be, again, getting to more directly in the next slide. 
But even if these ideas of grace and the salvation, which we can relate to justification, um, was all from God's grace, the idea that we don't have anything to do um, was, was not really in anybody's mind, because we certainly do um, have something to do. The question is, what <laughs> what is it and what relationship is to what we do and how we live our life and our sancti own sanctification process? How is that related to justification and our salvation and getting to the heaven? Now, one way around the idea of saying that, um, you know, it's, it's, it is God's grace and merit. It's not our merit. It's not what we do. It's what God does. Was the development of the idea of the treasury of merit. The treasury of merit, I think I referred to this before, was like a, a large bank account. The idea was that Jesus, by his death and resurrection, had merited, which is getting what you earn, getting what you deserve. You know what merit is. Had merited so much grace that it was sufficient to save everybody who had ever lived or whoever will live. It was placed there in an account, a treasury, a superabundance of grace. And it was the position of the Pope, Christ's vicar, as the divine banker to distribute that grace. The Pope held the keys to the treasury of merit and could distribute it as the Pope saw fit. And that will come back again, um, and uh, we'll see that again and again. So I wanted to introduce that here and to point out that it was only in the mid-14th century that that idea was really, I'm not going to say created, but formulated and uh, became an official church doctrine in 1343 by Pope, um, oh, I have it written down here too, Pope Clement VI, um, and his bull Unigenitus. So it's still a somewhat recent development. Um, not all that unusual necessary, just formulating what had been a traditional kind of thought and making it an official doctrine, uh, a, a papal pronouncement. Whereas when we get to um, the indulgences applying to souls in purgatory, that was controversial at the time. But we'll come back to that, as I said. So the whole issue was, if the Pope certainly has the means not by the Pope's own means, but by the Pope as the banker who can distribute Christ's merit. Anyone who is saved is saved based on Christ's merit and the grace of Christ that then the Pope can attribute to you or not. That's the idea of the treasury of merit. And that led to then more anxiety. What do I need to get to receive the grace? Now, the sacraments were part of the, that means of it, but Pope could attribute more uh, grace in the sacraments um, to to good works, to doing pilgrimages. Also, you know, he's in charge of absolution uh, in, in the, in the uh, sacrament of penance and, and absolution. So there's all kinds of, of ways you could, but how do you know? You know, how do you know what is being written there? How do you know you're going to have enough? And that led, especially in light of the crisis, and especially in light of after the the, you know, the Black Death and the schism and the anxiety and the rise in apocalypticism of the doctrine of doing one's best. Now, here we go with slide number four. And we have the anxiety of heaven and hell. And indeed it was. Um, if you start thinking about it, and if you really believe it, um, it's scary. Are you going to end up for eternity in heaven, or are you going to end up for eternity in hell? If you believe that those are your two options, what would you be willing to do to make sure you get into heaven, or even at least purgatory on your way to heaven, to avoid hell? And basically, it'd be anything. That would be the rational view, even if you didn't want to do it. I'm not going to elaborate on that too much, but the issue was, okay, People were suffering of it. I mean, it's how do I know, especially with the inscrutable will of God? How can I know? What is God going to do? If God can change God's mind any time, what's the point? We should just throw up our hands. And that's where this concept of covenant theology comes in. A covenant, we you know that from the no Noahic or the covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant covenant when God promises I will never destroy the world in a flood again. Uh, we know from the Abrahamic covenant uh, with the, the chosen people 
and uh, his offspring will be as multitudinous as the grains of sand. That is making a covenant. The covenant is when God binds God's self. I promise I will do this and I will stick to my promise. That is this covenant that God makes. And that concept, which had been there for all along, became applied to salvation. And the covenant was this, that God has bound God's self to make a covenant with human beings that I will not deny my grace to those who are doing their best. You don't have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. But you have to try to be do your best. That is what that Latin phrase there up on this uh, slide says, Facientibus cogens es Deus non denigrat gratiam. It's to those that do what is in them, God will not deny their grace. On the one hand, that became this, whew, okay, I can relax a little bit. I may not be the best person. I may not have done all the good works that I should have done that are necessary to do. But if I just do my best and try, if I make a good effort, God will give me grace. That'll be great. I can do it. That was the pastoral background to this, to relieve that anxiety. We'll come back to that as we go, because for Luther, it doesn't relieve anxiety at all. Because the question is, how do I know I'm doing my best? How do I know that I'm actually doing what is in me? Can I do more? Isn't there more in me that I can do? Because if I'm not doing my best, God's not going to give me his grace. And so in that sense, for someone like Luther, it was a terrifying doctrine. Even though it became the primary theological teaching of the later Middle Ages, with the Augustinian position being in the vast minority. But we'll come back to that. Uh, but that led to the question of what was the relationship between justification and sanctification. Um, do you have to become holy to be justified? Meaning, do you have to have that sanctification process first? And on that basis, you are justified. Or do you have to be justified first before you can become holy, before you can live a, a Christian life? And that relationship was a big one, uh, that, or a very important one, big one, uh, a central, uh, the question of that relationship was a central one for, for determining what type of theology you were pursuing, the nature of it, where you stood on this uh, concept of the covenant, and are you actually doing your best or not. Um, and the basic Augustinian position was that justification comes before sanctification. Um, and the basic, uh, more general view is that sanctification comes first and then ju justification. There's even, I've argued uh, in some cases, uh, a double justification, um, one in the beginning and one at the end, so to speak. So it gets becomes very kind of complex. But that's all gets to the answer the question of how do you get into heaven? How is one saved? What is salvation? How do you achieve it? How do you get it? How do you receive it? Whatever. And then how do you know? And that is the problem that was facing the theology at the academic level as well as, well as at the, the parish clergy level. Now, this is the last slide. I think I'll get through it. Uh, the first point on this last slide, theology in the parish clergy, is academic theology and practical theology. There is still a, a huge dis disjunction today uh, within the church between uh, what theologians are arguing amongst themselves and saying and debating and what is being taught and preached in the, in, to the people in the churches. And I could go off on that a, a, a fair amount. But that's not the point here. I just want to bring that up because if that's not something that you can uh, understand and ask me, I'm happy to elaborate and explain also how it relates to today. But there is this sense that, you know, the okay, the people, the academic theologians, they're doing their stuff, but what really matters is how do we live our life? What's being taught? What is my priest? What is my pastor? What is my minister telling me? What do I, you know, how do I understand um, when I read the Bible? What's supposed to be going on? And that is a, a real problem, that gap. Uh, I'm going to elaborate more on that for right now, but I want you to be aware of that gap. 
uh, which is in all academic issues. There's a huge gap between what uh, historians at the university know and proclaim about you know, a historical event or doctrine and what the general people and the public think about it. And that is a, a real problem between what I call uh, you know, elite expertise knowledge and general popular knowledge. That is there with theology too, but it's there in all aspects. You know, our, the physicists of today know a lot more than <laughs> the vast majority of people who might claim they know something about physics or how the world works or the, the universe. And oh, we see, you know, the latest article in the James Webb Telescope. Cool. But already the cosmologists are, are way above us <laughs> in what they're talking about. And that gap is a huge one in all disciplines. Uh, but also in theology, and since theology deals with you know eternal um, destinations, uh, it, it has more anxiety there. But we'll, that's in some ways again a separate issue, but not unrelated. But what is related is in the 15th century, 14th, 15th century. What was the level of education of the general priesthood? Because again, the theologians at the universities were relatively few. Even within the Minican orders, even just, you know, just becoming a, a secular parish priest, um, not everyone went. Only a, a few select would, would go to study theology, become you know masters of theology and doctors of theology. Um, certainly not. It wasn't required of, of every parish priest. The education level of the priesthood was actually pretty low. Um, I think I mentioned going back to the early medieval period in the, the proprietary church, the local prince would probably just select uh, some a villager who maybe could read through the Latin somewhat. Um, the emphasis on teaching the clergy, keep teaching the priests what they were, you know, how to perform their their duties, um, how to preach and what to preach became an issue beginning in the 11th century with this big reform movement, this attempt to um, institute programs of catechesis and instruction and education, that secondary Christianization process that I talked about. Even Jordan's exposition of the Lord's Prayer was not intended for people in the street to read. It was intended for friars, theologians, who would be going out to preach, who weren't going to become great theologians, but who would be going out and wanted to have enough theological under training and standing that number one they get it quote unquote right and they can relate to the people and relate the doctrine to the people that would help them understand that's the issue but when the level of theological understanding is so low or could be so low it's a problem because we're not talking about what is being argued about in the universities. We might have a problem with actually what is actually being taught in the pews or to the people in the pews in the parishes, in the local parishes. And saying, you know what, these clergy, I'm not talking about the theologians at the university, I'm talking about the parish priests, don't know what they're talking about. And what they are teaching their people and telling their people is a bunch of crap, or at least it's not very helpful. And it's not even in keeping with what the theologians are saying at the universities, the academics, with what the uh, hierarchy is even supporting. And that gets to be a real problem when there's a discrepancy between the support of the hierarchy, the papacy. And with the papacy sides with what is being popularly taught to the people against what's uh, being discussed and argued by the theologians. Now, I won't say anything comment about the, the contemporary church today on that issue, but I think it's a huge problem. Um, but it was in the 15th century too. And I'm not saying there were no problems uh, with the university theology. Um, but what was going on also at the university theology is that the theological training with the decline, the number of years and everything. Also, as we go into the 15th century, began to shift, began to shift to moral, practical theology away from speculative, systematic theology. So we don't have those uh, questions about, you know, what could God do uh, if God desired, if God is omnipotent. We have more issues of how do we get the grace that we need. Uh, that is really uh, an issue uh, that was there. And how do we make sure that priests uh, can do at least the bare minimum? Now, one of my Augustinians, Herman of Schildesche, uh, wrote in the mid-14th century a handbook for the simple parish priest. His Speculum Manuale Sacerdotum, 
Um, it's not the only handbook written for the, the education of the clergy. There was no educational program set up for the clergy. Um, it was not like you could not be ordained if you didn't had, had not studied at the university and at least a bachelor's of theology. That was not established at this point. It was beginning to be and would become that in the course of the 16th century, but in the 15th century, in the 14th and 15th century, it wasn't. Now, Herman's, uh, Herman Schulache's speculum is fantastic. Uh, it was one of the most widely distributed treatises uh, for the education of the clergy. It has really never been studied except by me. People, a couple of other people have mentioned it, um, but not, not, not a lot. And part of the reason is this is that this level of theological uh, knowledge, training, works are not you know, revolutionary new ideas are not you know, exciting intellectually on one level. Um, and so intellectual historians traditionally or theologians don't deal with it because they don't really contribute to theology. Uh, people who are looking at culture uh, don't really care that much about the clergy, but they should. Uh, so they don't really deal with it either. But it's fantastic what Clement uh, Herman does and did because he says, okay, if you are a simple parish priest somewhere out you know, there, Also, this is to alleviate their anxiety. Okay, too. Don't worry about getting everything right. But there are three sacraments you have to be able to deal with: baptism, the Eucharist, and absolution, confession, and absolution. So those are the three he addresses. Now, those are the, you, know, you can't ordain other people. Only a bishop can do that. This is not for bishops. This is for the simple parish priest. Oh yeah, you have to you know celebrate marriage, but the marriage isn't that big of a deal. You have to perform last last rites, but that's also not that big of a deal. It's kind of not all that different from you know, the Eucharist and things. But those are the three biggies that you got to do: uh, baptism, Eucharist, and, and that. Now he divides each up into a form uh, and matter. I'll just take baptism for example. He says, okay, uh, the the matter of baptism is uh, water. You have to use water. And the form is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he also says, you know, things like this. What you can't do. Things to worry about. You need to use water. You cannot use, he said, these are things that you cannot use for baptism. You cannot use wine. You cannot need, use urine. And you cannot use tree sap. You think, what the hell? Were people trying to baptize people with tree sap? Were people trying to baptize people with urine or with wine? What is going on here? Well, he says, but if there is urine, wine, or tree sap in the water, that's okay. Don't worry about it as long as it's primarily water. Now, in the 14th, 15th century, and all those before, there was not no modern plumbing. You know, water would have to be gotten from the local well. So you, you know, you're in this little village. You have to perform a baptism. You go to the center of town. There's the well. You fill it up with what you know, water. What do you know what's in it? Maybe there's a tree hanging over it. So it's like, oh my god, if, if tree sap is dripped in the well, what do I do with that? Why? Maybe someone spilled, or it was off. I'm going to say too. Maybe you know, some people, a couple of guys, went out to the pub the night before. And they're stumbling home drunk, and also you know, there's the well, and they really got to go. Uh, they can't make it to the outhouse. So what do they do? They pee in the well, of course. Oops. Or they puke in the well, or it's, you know, so the wine gets in it that way. And Herman's point was, don't worry about it. He's not saying it's a good thing. It will still work. If you try using just wine, that will not work for an effective baptism. As long as the liquid that you're using is primarily water, it will. Now, what about the words used? I baptized you. Now, in Latin, it is um, um, baptismo te, I baptize you, in nomine patris, filii et spiritus sancti. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now he says, you know, you try to get it right, but you at least have to get the first part of the words right. You also cannot baptize someone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Mother, or the Father, uh, the Mother, and Saint Jude. 
or anybody else. It has to be you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that kind of indicates that maybe people were even confused of whom they, you know, what the names would be used to baptize someone. And he says, you know, if you get the grammar wrong, which is the ending of the word, it's not a big deal. If you say uh, baptismo te in nomino patras filios et spirita sancti, that makes no sense whatsoever. It will still work. It will be an effective baptism because that first part is there. Okay. If you mess up the first part, that will be is a problem. So you have to get that first part right. You cannot say you know baptismo te and nomine atras um, ilis et you know uh, iritus sancto. Um, it has to be that first part. So we know what the word is. It's called the force of the word has to be there, even if it's not grammatically correct. That's the level of education we're talking about. And he goes on into other cases and problem cases of baptism, like what do you do if you're baptizing Siamese twins um, and all kinds of other things. It's fantastic. But you really get an insight into what's going on at, on, at the local parish level. Also in terms of the Eucharist, what do you do? And he says, what do you do if you, know, you, you, you puke? You're a priest and you go in and you've consecrated the elements. We have the, you know, the blood of the body of Christ and you puke on the body of you know, How do you take care of that? He deals with these issues. What happens if you consecrated the chalice uh, so it's the blood of Christ and a spider falls in it? Those kinds of things. It's fun stuff. Fun stuff. That's the level we're talking about. He's not talking about, let's talk about the relationship between justification and sanctification, which and how it all works together, or an infusion of grace and the treasury of merit. He's not talking about those things. He's talking about very practical issues. And that it was the daily life of the parish priest and the daily life of the majority, the vast majority uh, of people in Europe at this time. And that then gets to the issue of theology and catechesis and what was being preached and taught. Um, we do have sermons. We have model sermon collections, and the sermons I mentioned about Jordan, and the sermons uh, collection that he included his exposition of the Lord's Prayer on, are these model sermon collections. And this, too, was to help the parish clergy, as was, as I mentioned already, with Antonius Rampagolus and his Figuri Biliorum. That was a handbook to help the preachers. The parish clergy, the, the Augustinians, obviously, uh, for, for Rampagolus and for Jordan, uh, for Hermann, his treatise, by the way, he sent to all uh, like nine different bishops in Germany within the empire, and they became his book became like the standard handbook throughout the empire in, in, in the German-speaking lands. Uh, that's how popular and influential it was. That's why I also mentioned it here. I should have gotten that before going back to Rampagolus and the education of the clergy. Um, so that, that's important to know. So it's not a local issue; it's widespread. That was widely used. As seeing as, as significant and important for the simple parish clergy, it wasn't for bishops, it wasn't for the university theologians. Even though Herman was, he had been trained to Paris. He did write a sentence, his commentary, etc. But he's also writing these pastoral treatises to help. Um, now, going back to the theology and catechesis, um, that was the dilemma and the challenge. How do we join the theology, the academic theology, with catechetical endeavor of what people should be taught and how the priesthood should be taught. How should priests be taught? And sermons, what should be preached? Because sermons is what people are being taught every week as they go, if not multiple times a week. And these model sermon collections, such as Jordan's, I'm not saying Jordan never gave one of those sermons, um, but the function was, here is, you know, you poor parish priests out there, if you don't know what to say, use one of these. Pick it up, use one of these. You can modify it maybe as you will, but use one of mine. You got it. Going out through through the liturgical year, um, it works. It will be a help. And the point of all this, again, is that disjunction between academic learned theology in the universities and the parish theology of the local parish priest in a more general sense. And relating the two could be very difficult, uh, somewhat convoluted, and problematic. And so how do we do that? And that's where we have the re theology, religion, and theological understanding on the age of crisis and anxiety. Um, I can almost say that no one was satisfied with it, except for the people who are being taught. I mean, if you go you know, to Mass, you're in a small you know, uh, village, you go to your parish church, you listen to what your priest tells you. You believe what your priest tells you. 
you don't sit here and say yes but that's that's not what you know uh, the fourth Lateran council said or that's not what you know uh, pope john the 22nd asserted you listen to them you don't you yourself don't have that educational background to debate it the theologians do, but the theologians aren't sitting there looking, you know, at every parish, uh, <laughs> everywhere, and evaluating, and then you know, telling the priest that you don't know what you're talking about. You need to get more education. Bishops don't even do that because bishops are still their prince bishops, especially increasingly at this time. They may now be more resident than they had been, but they're still prince bishops dealing with politics, church policy on the the large scale, not on what is going on in the. Uh, in the local parishes. That's the issue. That was the issue. And when people hear different things and are told different things, that's going to be a sense of anxiety. The whole pastoral endeavor, especially in the 15th century as we go into it, was to help how to relieve that anxiety, how to help people. And that was this, you know, just do your best. Don't worry about it. And the church is good. You know, if you do what you you know should be doing and can do, if you just do what's in you, you will receive grace, you will receive merits, and actually we can also you know, give you indulgences to help out as well. That's the point where I'll stop here for today, because that's the point that kind of was the powder keg that sets off a lot, even though that's not what the Reformation as such was about, um, even though it's always seen that Luther's critique against indulgences. There's a whole history behind that. It does not come out of the blue. Um, but those are the issues we're dealing with. Academic theology, pastoral theology for those people, um, how to relate the two, what to make of it, and how to relieve people to anxiety, especially when theological education in the 15th century, especially, starts to decline and decline and decline and decline in terms of the number of years required for the degree to become a doctor of theology, the requirements kept being lowered, the standards kept being lowered, and then this shift from the speculative academic questions to questions of moral theology. How, you know, how does purgatory work? How do indulgences work? How do the treasury of merit work? How do the sacraments work? This whole shift on the academic level led to, you know, almost an ignoring of basic fundamental principles of academic systematic theology. Not completely, certainly, not completely at all, but there was that shift of emphasis addressed to this age of crisis. How do we relieve people's fear and anxiety? That's what it was about. That's the context, even as the fear and the anxiety remained. Now, finally finished. Week 5, Lecture 1. My apologies for going on so much. Uh, I'll get this posted as Part 2, and then uh, I'll work on getting uh, Week 5, Lecture 2 posted, and I'll try to keep that as succinct as possible, but it does uh, also play a part in all of this and the build-up to what we're doing and where we're going, also in terms of education, but education on a broader scale in terms of the universities as such. But that's the subject for next lecture. Thank you very much.